it's time to start the Valentine's Day challenges. Seems like just yesterday I was doing back to school. Unbelievable. So in this one, students are designing a bow and arrow for Cupid in order to help him with target practice and delivering that love potion, also known as paint. Before I get ahead of myself, let's check out the materials in the STEM challenge cycle. This is the STEM challenge cycle you should follow for every challenge. I've defined each step in another video. I've added a pop-in card to that video here, as well as a link in the description. So this target is nine pieces of paper put together, and you can really use anything. And I've seen teachers just use one sheet of paper with the heart, and there's no problem with that. I just recommend using a large panel because more students can be successful in that case. And it's really exciting when you hit the target. And no matter the age group, you're gonna to wanna to use washable paint. So I would recommend putting students in groups for this one. You're gonna to wanna to have the groups make at least one bow, and then every student should make an arrow. They don't have to be different from each other. They can each make the same design if they like, but each student should have an arrow. I prefer to have one student work on the bow and everybody else do an arrow, then the person who did the bow should just borrow someone else's arrow when it comes time to do the testing. Now, if you have young students, attempting to do a bow and an arrow could be a little bit tricky, so you could modify this and have them do darts instead. You're going to also want to think about where to place your target so that you don't get paint where you wouldn't want it. Also, a place where you could retrieve any errant arrows. These are the arrows or darts that I have left. I started with four, but two of them are presently in my neighbor's yard. And then these are the three bows. Of course, before you start, you wanna do your basic safety dance. Remind students not to point arrows at each other. Of course, on your criteria and constraints, one of the constraints should always be that there will be no sharp edges to their arrows or their darts because Cupid is a lover, not a fighter. The distance that you have students stand away from the target is probably gonna correlate with their age group. But typically I'd say start with maybe five feet. You and your students are gonna to wanna to pack your patience for this challenge. Now, oftentimes it takes a little bit of practice in order to get a rhythm with shooting the bow and arrow. Sometimes there's absolutely nothing wrong with the design, but it's how the students are using the design that's causing that arrows not to go any further than they should. I will show you a few examples. So some that you just saw being unsuccessful were the very same arrows that later were successful. And in fact, one surprised me because one of the arrows I had been using was pretty effective. It was going, you know, five to 10 feet. Uh, but one of the times it went, it had to be 20 or 30 feet because Typically students really enjoy this challenge, but it can be frustrating when you're trying to shoot your bow and arrow and it's not working. So one thing you can do is ask students, what's happening or what's not working? Sometimes just when the students verbalize, well, the paint is making the arrow heavy and so it won't shoot. And hopefully that gets them to a point where they realize they don't need to use quite so much paint or they could use a smaller um, portion of the sponge or cotton ball in order to dab in the paint. Or, or maybe they need to work on the bow in order to deliver more force to the arrow. If they don't make that next leap on their own, then you follow up with, well, what needs to happen? Or what could you try next? If they aren't as successful as they'd like to be, definitely have students try to analyze what is wrong. Is it the design itself? Is it the way they're using it? Is it a combination of those factors? And then another option, if you are working with the bow and arrow and it's not working as well as you'd like it to, is you can always switch it to darts or allow the students to move closer to the target. But don't give up too early. I'm telling you, it takes a little bit of trial and error. When you get to the point where you're going to actually be measuring results, again, make sure that you've given students lots of time to practice. If you are using one target for the entire class, try to give each group a different color paint so it's easy to tell who hit what part of the target. But each of these symbols has point values attached. The lowest point value picture is the, the hearts that are in the corner are worth five points. So I would make hitting anywhere on the paper worth maybe two or three points. And assuming this is on a fence or a wall, I would even probably give students a point for just hitting the wall. So when they're tallying their official results, I have each member of the team take three official shots, whether it's with the bow and arrow or if it's throwing the dart and they can either sum their points or take an average. 
A few things that you can do to add difficulty. First thing is stand further away from the target. Second thing is you can add a secondary challenge to create a quiver for Cupid to hold his arrows. Now, of course, Cupid flies, so it needs to be lightweight and he needs to have easy access to it, but it also needs to be something that won't allow the arrows to fall out. You can use darts rules as inspiration and you can change the goal rather than being the most points or the highest average score to hitting the four corners or hit all of the cupcakes and the fewest number of shots or have students come up with their own version of rules. To extend on this one, of course, you've got potential and kinetic energy. You ask students to write a story or a comic strip in which Cupid uses their designs, which could be quite comical depending on how good their designs were. And you can have students create their own math problems based on their designs or anything to do with the challenge. So you have the basics, you're ready to do this challenge on your own, but definitely check out the resource, it's going to help you out a lot. You're going to fall in love with this resource. It contains everything you need to guide your students through the Cupid's Quiver Challenge, including modifications for use with 2nd through 8th graders. You'll still need to gather the simple materials, of course, but the hard parts are done. You'll get aligned next-gen science standards, links to my STEM Challenge how-to videos to help you get the most from each challenge, and the Cupid's Quiver materials list. In teacher tips, you'll find premise and setup, how to increase or decrease difficulty through the criteria and constraints list, measuring results and cross-curricular extension suggestions. You'll find an editable criteria and constraints list so you can tailor the challenge to your students. You'll also get targets in color and black and white. For student handouts, there are two versions, four-page expanded room for response for younger students and a two-page condensed space paper saver version. You'll also find a set of group discussion questions as well as two options for recording results. In the extension handouts, you'll find cause and effect notes, a practice activity with three versions and answer key, as well as math extension and process flow templates. This resource is available individually and as part of the discounted Valentine's and Mega STEM Challenge bundles. Links can be found in the description below the video. Well, okay, that's it for week one. Next week, I'm going to be back with heavy hearts. Make sure that you like and subscribe. I will see you next time.